Hello, my name is Will Green, and I'm one of the pastors and the director of discipleship at Foundry United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C. This series, titled Lectures on Lament, was designed to help deepen our understanding of the experience and expression of Christian lament as a spiritual discipline. Together, we will explore the deep gifts that both individual and communal lament hold for the life of discipleship and identify concrete ways to incorporate it into our daily lives. In this fourth lecture, Dr. Isetta Autumn Mobley of Foundry explores lament through the lenses of racial justice and womanism. In her lecture titled Song in a Weary Throat, Dr. Mobley invites us to understand the history of black, queer, and woman-led activism and how lament in their leadership provides a model by which we might more fully pursue racial justice and equity in our world. And as we come into space today, it is my distinct honor uh, to welcome one of my colleagues and partners in ministry at the United Methodist Church, uh, Dr. Isetta Autumn Mobley. Uh, Dr. Mobley has been not only uh, uh, an important part of our discipleship ministries team at Foundry, helping us think critically and creatively about how we're creating space for people to grow in their, their discipleship, but she's offered herself in multiple ways to help us think um, with, with care uh, and with intention about how we are creating space always to confront the things we need to confront in ourselves so that we can grow into the fullness of the image of Christ that we're called to be in the world. Uh, Isetta, you are one of my, my dear colleagues, and I am so grateful uh, that you have joined us today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Pastor Will, and thank you to everyone who is joining. You'll see you maybe got a little bit more information than I intended there, a little behind the scenes piece, but you'll get to see um, that my bio is placed there, and then today's lecture title is also placed there. But I want to begin um, with uh, a passage from Toni Morrison's Beloved. Here, she said, in this here place, we flesh, flesh that weeps and laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet and grass. Love it, love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together. Stroke them on your face because they don't love that either. You got to love it, you. And no, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they do not hear. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leavens instead. No. They don't love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved. Feel that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms, strong arms. I'm telling you. Oh, my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck, put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up, and all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs. You got to love them. The dark, dark liver, love it. Love it. And the beat and beating heart, love that too, more than eyes or feet, more than lungs that have yet to draw free air, more than your life holding womb and your life giving parts. Hear me now. Love your heart, for this is the prize. 
That is from Toni Morrison's Beloved. And I begin there because I think it is such a call of both lament and hope and such a tradition of African-American women's lament and hope. For those who have read Beloved, that particular scene um, comes in a hush harbor and a secret place um, that we might think about as a place where enslaved people would go to be away from white surveillance, to pray and be together and to revel in both hopefulness, but also to speak lament, to speak the pains that were not allowed to be spoken. So I want to invoke that as we love our hearts, but also as we journey together to thinking about race and lament. So welcome to Song and a Weary Throat, a hymn for liberation, our lecture for today. Um, if, for those of you who'd like to follow up to be in touch, this is how you can connect with me, either through Twitter or you can email me. So I'd like to ask a question and encourage you to use the chat to answer. Which Sesame Street character best characterizes your current mood today? And you can put that in the chat. So I see big birds, several big birds, Elmo's, Feeling like the count today, okay. I hope there are cookies in your future for those of you who feel like the count. Some Elmo's, right? Maybe a little bit of Bert and Ernie, or Ernie rather, who's happy Elmo Big Bird, right? So a range of different emotions as we begin today. Um, I wanna take us back to thinking about that quote from Toni Morrison. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off and leave empty. Love your hands, love them, raise them up and kiss them. Because I think that this is such an encapsulation of both a lament, um, but also a call to hope and a call to action that's embedded there. Uh, the image you're seeing on the right is by Charles White, who was a famous Chicago-based African-American artist who trained at the Art Institute of Chicago and is known in particular for his realistic and beautiful lithographs um, and how they often grounded history. Um, and it features, of course, a woman lifting up her hands and body and praise and perhaps lament. Today's Psalms really resonated with me as I thought about this talk, and as I thought about particularly a Black womanist theological perspective, and thinking about this idea of you taught me wisdom in that secret place. When Morrison is reading that, is writing that piece about um, lift up your hands, O Lord, or lift up your hands, they're learning and talking about that in a secret place, in a hush harbor. And it's a place where uh, Baby Suggs, who is saying that speech that I started out with, is calling for people to think about their own joy and gladness in the face of a great deal of oppression and a moment at which literally um, the bones have been crushed and that this is a place in a hush harbor where people are coming together to rejoice despite pain, despite discomfort, and are actually getting a call to action. So thinking about today and thinking about what does it mean to lament racial injustice? What does that mean? What does that look like? How do people experience it? So we're gonna do some conversation about race. And I wanna take a moment to come up with some and talk about some community norms. One, speaking from the I perspective, being fully present, be self-responsible and self-challenging, listen, listen, listen and process, lean into discomfort, take some risks, be raggedy, make some mistakes and then let go, suspend judgment, be brief, say what is core, experiment with new behaviors in order to elicit new responses, and treat the candidness of others as a gift, honor confidentiality. 
Are there any questions? You're welcome to say, um, put questions in the chat or I can clarify any pieces. I know that when we talk about race, that sometimes means that we're leaning into discomfort um, and that we have only an hour together. So we wanna be brief and say what is core, but give people opportunity to speak. And that we wanna elicit new responses. So sometimes that means that for someone who speaks a lot, maybe this is an opportunity to listen. And if for someone who hangs back, maybe this is an opportunity to speak. So I also wanna talk about what this is and what this ain't. Thank you to Marlon Riggs. Um, if you've not seen the documentary, Tongues Untied, uh, which Marlon Riggs creates about being a gay black man with HIV, I encourage you to see it. So this is an opportunity to begin to reflect on race and lamentation. It's an opportunity to begin to think about how you put justice at the center of your faith. It's an opportunity to learn and share with one another and an opportunity to create a space to learn. But this is what it isn't. It isn't a place to get all of the answers. It isn't a personalized one-on-one -on -one session on race in the U.S. and in the Methodist Church. And I'm not a sage on the stage offering all of the solutions, nor is it probably a traditional lecture. Um, and I want to talk about what you might need. You might find a notebook and pen useful. Um, please take care of yourself. Get a cup of tea or water. Um, it might be helpful for you to take uh, or have an open, if you're on your laptop, an open window so you can check out some of the things that I mentioned. And, you know, snacks are always really important. I also want to let you know that it's okay to step away or turn off your camera as you need. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. It's okay to feel all the feelings from sadness to despair to rage. And it's okay if this is the first time you're reflecting about race and justice and faith, that those things are okay. So a little bit about myself. Yes, I am a doctor uh, and I'm a scholar, but I'm not a trained theologian or a biblical scholar, right? So I just want to put that as a caveat. I can only diagnose cultural phenomenon. I cannot help you with um, sciatica or any other pieces of, me of medical advice, not that kind of doctor. Um, and I can't legally prescribe you any of the fun drugs, hashtag decriminalized drugs. Um, and yes, I am articulate. So let's take a moment and talk about microaggressions. Often when we talk about race, sometimes we inadvertently trespass on each other. Um, and this is to say that the I am articulate or being articulate is often a microaggression that many people of color um, experience. So I just wanna invite us to think about our community norms and being mindful of micro our small comments or ideas or concepts that we express to each other that reveal implicit racial bias, right? So yes, I am articulate and my mom would say thank you because that's why I'm articulate. Uh, this talk is informed for me uh, by Polly Murray. I don't know how many of you are aware of Polly Murray. Um, maybe some of you can say yes or no in the chat or you can throw up um, a reaction um, on your screen. But Polly Murray was a poet and writer um, born in the teens of the 20th century. Uh, she was a legal scholar, an architect of Brown versus the Board of Education, though she did not find that out until much later. Um, she had decided that she was going to go to law school. She applied to Harvard and was not admitted because of her gender, um, and then uh, decided to go to Howard Law School instead. And while she was at Howard Law School, she authored a brief sample that argued that you could challenge board versus the board, of, uh, that you could challenge segregation. Um, and she wrote this incredible brief. And at the time, her all, nearly all male legal class laughed at her and said it wasn't possible. But then later when Thurgood Marshall and her mentor, who was also her teacher, uh, were trying to challenge um, the Board of Education and Segregation, they used her paper as the model. So she is actually the architect for Brown versus Board of Education. She's the co-founder of NOW, 
She ha she happened to also help get the language of the Equal Rights Amendment authored. And then later she became an Episcopal priest. It's her memoir, which I'll hold up here, Song in a Weary Throat, from which the title of this lecture comes and my exploration of ideas about what does it mean to lament, right? In her short book of poetry, she released a poem um, called Dark Testament. And in that poem, she said, hope is a crushed stalk between clenched fingers. Hope is a bird's wing broken by a tone. Hope is a word in a tuneless ditty, a word whispered with the wind, a dream of 40 acres and a mule, a cabin of one's own and a moment to rest, a name and place for one's children and children's children at last. Hope is a song in a weary throat. The reason I thought about this is this idea of a song in a weary throat is because this poem is such an example of an African-American tradition of both lament about racism's impact with hope right there. So that the two are tied together, that it's both lament and then hope is met with it. And it, you'll notice that Polly Murray in this sort of idea about what hope is and hoping even when one is lamenting, that she's also embedding that with history. So a dream of 40 acres and a mule. Many people will recognize this as a reconstruction promise. So after the Civil War ends, reconstruction begins, although it doesn't last for very long. Radical reconstruction lasts less than a decade. Um, but part of radical re uh, Reconstruction after the Civil War was this idea of what did restorative justice and what did it look like to um, repay formerly enslaved African Americans. And one of those ideas was 40 acres and a mule. It was specifically um, about a piece of land in South Carolina um, where people were promised to be repatriated land that was formerly um, owned by their masters. And then that doesn't happen. Uh, and the idea was, what does it mean when that's taken away from you? So again, this play with lamentation, but also with hope. And it caused me to ask the question, what happens if race and gender equity are at the center of my faith? What does that look like? What happens when we put race and gender at the center of faith? What kind of spiritual and reflective work is necessary to achieve equity and justice? And who teaches me about racial equity, liberation, and justice? What do my four parents say? And when I started to ask that question, certainly I turned to Polly Murray, but I also turned to people like Octavia Butler and Audre Lorde and Polly Murray and Ida B. Wells and Fannie Lou Hamer and Katie Cannon and Prathia Hall and Harriet Jacobs and Harriet Powers, right? This list of people who contributed to my idea about what it was and what it is to build a theology where you put race and gender equity at the center. I just actually wanna spend a moment to speak about some of the people who are here. And I encourage you in the chat, if there are people that you recognize to place their names here. Um, but I'll take a moment to talk about Sojourner Truth, who um, actually is powerfully moved by an evangelical faith um, and is often associated with the Quaker movement, but also had a faith that was far more expansive. Most people have heard this idea that Sojourner Truth said, ain't I a woman? And I will say that she did not actually say that. She said, aren't I a woman? And the reason that she said, aren't I a woman is because Sojourner Truth's initial first language was actually Dutch. She was held in bondage in upstate New York and then later partly in New York City and her first language was Dutch. 
But a white parishioner heard her speak and translated or decided to translate her words into ain't to add this patina of an idea of what a Southern Black person would sound like. Of course, Sojourner Truth is not a Southern Black person. She was enslaved in New York. Um, and she's talking about, aren't I a woman? Do I not have the rights to be seen as a human person? Um, so thinking about sort of the ways in which, in particular, Black women have articulated a faith that is grounded in both race and gender and liberation. I also want to point your attention to a woman by the name of Prathia Hall. Prathia is the woman in white with her arm lifted in front of an altar. I want to talk about Prathia Hall because Prathia Hall is where Martin Luther King initially got his um, uh, refrain of, I have a dream. Prathia was born in Pennsylvania and lived with her parents. Her father was a preacher. And Prathia was one of the few coordinators um, who was elected to work in the South, who was a woman working in the South. And um, there were a series of church fires and Martin Luther King went to the church fire in the rural South and Prathia and a number of other people were gathered to pray. And Prathia was known as being an incredible preacher. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr. had once said about Prathia that he was the, she was the one person whom he never wanted to follow in preaching. And Prathia gets up and she's standing at the outlines of this burned out church that white supremacists have burned to the ground. And she begins to talk about her sorrow at this happening. And then she transitions from her lament to saying that she has a dream. And she repeats that over and over again. And that is actually where MLK gets his idea of I have a dream. In fact, he asked permission of Prathia Hall to use that phrasing. And he begins to then incorporate it into his preaching. So that Mahalia Jackson hears him preaching this and using this as a rhetorical turn and sees him begin to stumble a bit at that infamous march on the famous march on Washington and notices that he's having a hard time. Now, mind you, no black women were speaking at the march on Washington, right? And Mahalia Jackson tells Martin, tell them about the dream because she had seen him speak previously about it. And then you get that extemporaneous rift on I have a dream. But the grounding of that speech comes from a Black womanist theology as taught to us by Prathia Hall. So as I was saying, this idea about what happens if we think about a Black womanist theology as having grounded one of the most famous speeches about racial equity in the United States. Might we think about a very different kind of theology or ideas about thinking about what it looks like to put race and racial justice at the center of our faith? Might we imagine something like artist Wangechi Mutu's Forbidden Fruit Picker, um, sort of a play on Eve, where you're a forbidden fruit picker and yet you pick the fruit anyway, right? This play on what does it mean to search for knowledge? Wangechi Mutu says that the Black female body has been violated and revered in very specific ways by the outsider, Europeans especially. The issues that pertain to race, uh, pathologizing the Black mind, exoticizing and fearing of the Black body, objectifying the body as a specimen or a sexual machine or a work animal, or relating the Black body to non-human species as a way to justify cruelty, all these are practices that are placed excessively upon the black female body. And so what kind of lamenting happens out of that? What kind of faith happens out of that lamentation? Well, we might think about someone like Rosa Parks who thought about what liberatory care could look like from her space of lament. So many people think of Rosa Parks as someone who just got too tired and sat on the bus. Um, but in fact, uh, Rosa Parks' first um, 
work uh, with civil rights started in the 30s. Um, many people will know uh, the Reese Taylor story of a woman who was sexually assaulted by several white men um, in the deep rural South. And uh, Rosa Parks went um, to the South to make sure that Rosa Park, uh, Reese would get justice. It was very rare for white men who sexually assaulted Black women to be tried, but there was a trial and Reese was willing to testify. And Rosa Parks went South uh, with the NAACP to support Reese. So by the time she sat on that bus, right, she had uh, been an activist who was trained by the Highlander School for Liberation. She was a trained activist and organizer. Um, and then after she sat on that bus, she was essentially no longer able to get employment in Montgomery. She and her husband had to move to Detroit. Um, this is a little known fact, but the founder of Little Caesars Pizza ended up paying for her rent because she was essentially unemployable. So even though she would be invited to talk and speak, she was not materially taken care of. Um, and then in the 1970s, she actually trained to become a yoga teacher as a part of her own self-care, right? So thinking about what kinds of self-care and liberatory self-care we might think about. But what is it that we are liberating ourselves from? Any guesses as to what this is an image of? You can put it in the chat. Any guesses as to what this could be? Okay. So this is actually a signing of the Declaration of Independence. All of the people um, without red dots on their faces are people who did not enslave people. All of the people with red dots on their faces represent the number of people who signed the Declaration who were enslavers right, who enslaved people. So when we're thinking about this history of lament, part of what we're thinking about with race and the United States is this history of lament that goes back to our very founding. But Black women have been constantly thinking about what does it mean to create something else? So I'm thinking about the Combahee River Collective of 1977, a group of Black women scholars, thinkers, poets, and artists who stated, we find our origins in the historical reality of Afro-American women's continuous life and death struggle for liberation. Black women have always embodied, if only in their physical manifestation, an adversary stands to white male rule and have actively resisted its inroads upon them and their communities in both dramatic and subtle ways. As Black women, we find any type of biological determinism a particularly dangerous and reactionary basis upon which to build a politics. Some people will recognize this language as being part of womanism. Alice Walker talked about womanism. So as an idea of womanism is to feminism as, uh, as lavender is to purple. This idea that womanism is grounded in an idea that Black women who are deeply spiritually grounded are breaking oppressions, not just for race and gender, but all oppressions. And that helps to, in the 70s, bring about this articulation of a Black womanist theology. Great. So I'm gonna pause here for a moment and I'm gonna ask you on a sheet of paper to think about your own social identifiers. How do you identify? How do you identify along your age, race, socioeconomic status, gender, ethnicity, faith, and sexual orientation. So age, you might think younger, middle-aged, older, race, we might think about um, what we think about as um, white or of African descent or Asian. Um, ethnicity is about nationality. So for instance, um, Latinx or Latino is not a race, it's an ethnicity, right? Socioeconomic status, you have not enough, 
more than enough, just enough. Go ahead and take one minute to do that. Okay, great. So time, I want us to think about why does it matter when we think about our social identifiers? Well, here's some things to think about with regards to race and identity in the United States. 83.1 million millennials, right? So more millennials than baby boomers, right? Um, are, we have surpassed baby boomers by nearly 10 million. Right. Many of those people identify as people of color. Those under five years old in the U.S. are now far more likely to identify as people of color. As of 2014, slightly over 50 percent or just about half of children born in the U.S. are children of color. That currently Hawaii, the District of Columbia, California, New Mexico and Texas all have higher populations of people of color. And according to the Center for American Progress, people for, uh, of color will have $3.16 trillion of buying power, not to bring capitalism into things, but thinking about those pieces. So what does that have to do with lament? What does that have to do with address, complaint, and appeal? The thing that we've been thinking about when we think about lament and race, what does that have to do with it? What are we, after all, lamenting? So I'm gonna show a series of images to get us to think about what it is that we are lamenting. I want to let everyone know that some of the images are startling or upsetting, um, and I will pause for a moment for everyone to look carefully at them. So what I will say is that the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. That quote comes from James Baldwin. And I want to pause for a moment there and ask people to share what is an image um, that really stood out to you in that series of images. You can place it in the chat or you can say it out loud. The child standing in front of the row of police officers. 
the little girl being escorted to school. That, of course, yes, um, Patricia is. Um, that is Ruby Bridges, who that, is. A, thank you. <laughs> yep, Ruby Bridges being escorted in by um, federal marshals, and she, of course, is still living, and is in her mid sixties. If maybe not even that, she's five years old at that time. Good. Other images. The contrasting lunch counters, the juxtaposition of the two images of police officers, mm -hmm. right? Any other images? It, the kind of the Norman Rockwell version of the family. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. This idea that we have very different in this country, if you're a person of color and you're a white person, that your idea of history might be fundamentally different, right? That maybe it's a Norm, Norman Rockwell freedom, that's the freedom from series. So freedom from want, freedom from um, hunger, right? And that that's a very different image um, than the image that we saw of this black woman standing in front of the American flag that's actually taken at the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of American History. She's a janitor, uh, a woman who had cleaned every part of that building, right? These are very fundamentally different histories and that may change how and what we are lamenting, right? But that it might also have to do with um, the way that we think about trauma that when we think about race in this country and the particularly racism, because I will say that there's an important distinction to be made that race as in our phenotypical differences, right? Race is the social construct, which is yes, problematic to a certain degree, but this idea of race, the fact that we have different cultural identities isn't the problem. Racism is the problem. The value that we place on people is the problem, right? So the trauma of not race, but racism, the trauma of racism, we might think about acute, meaning when we think about trauma studies, we think about something that's acute, right? Um, it's a single event, or we might think about it as chronic, prolonged and sustained exposure. And then we might think about compl complex, multiple traumatic events. So that racism in this country and the way that people of color from indigenous people, right? And I am on, and we are, I am calling in from indigenous land that was uh, Piscataway and Nakochenk land, right? From indigenous people to Latinx folks, to Asian folks in this country, to African-Americans, there has been a series of trauma directly related to racism that is acute, chronic, and complex. And yet people of color may have the more acute forms of trauma related to race, but we are certainly not the only ones traumatized under race because being taught the entitlement of white privilege or white supremacy is its own kind of trauma that also has to be unlearned. But I bring up the way that we're seeing history differently to think about the idea that they're very different traumas, right? And that our ideas of what history might be right? We might not understand the ways that history is coming to bear and we're being unconsciously controlled by history. So that gets me to thinking about where is our work? Um, Pastor Will shared with me just before we joined this phenomenal piece of information that um, the same architect who designed Asbury designed Foundry. Um, and that it is a Black architect who designed both. And you'll notice how similar the two churches look. One, of course, being a church uh, that comes out of segregation from our own congregation, right? And one that sort of had submerged this knowledge of a Black architect. So literally the very building in which we pray, right, and live out our faith, in so many different ways. The architect, right, thinking about that as, as a Black architect and 
how that is spoken about or not spoken about and what that means about Christian faith in the United States at a moment in which there's a real conversation about the embedded racism in Christianity and white evangelicism or even ideas about Christianity being white, right? Who is barred from participation and full participation in a Christian faith? So we might think about the pieces of lament, of despair and protest, resistance, confession, and penitential lament. And I'd like to offer that if we're thinking about a Black womanist theology, that we might add a few pieces to the structure of lament. That we might think about lament and racism or the lament of racial injustice as being address, complaint, appeal, hope, and then restorative action. That the lament does not stop at the appeal, but proceeds into a space of hope and restorative action. That, that there is deep trust and that we see this frequently in a black womanist theology, that black women are grounding their complaint and their lament in a trust in God and that that lament then transforms into hope and then transforms into restorative action, which is how you get the civil rights movement, which is how you get the Black Lives Matter movement, which is how you get Say Her Name, which is both a lament, but a call for restorative action, right? That it never just stops at the appeal that we lament and trust in our lamenting to gain strength and then restorative action. I wanted to talk about this idea of a cycle of oppression. That oppression is this idea of um, the exercise of power through control of resources, right? Structural asymmetries, right? This idea that not everyone has what they need. We might think about cycles of oppression of a fear of difference that becomes a stereotype, that becomes prejudice, that becomes discrimination, that becomes oppression, and that then becomes internalized oppression. So if we did this with race, there's a fear of difference, right, that lends itself to stereotypes, things like um, uh, Black people just don't work hard enough right? It becomes a stereotype that lends itself to a prejudice. Um, black people just don't work hard enough. I don't really want to work with Black people. That then becomes discrimination. I don't think Black people work hard enough. I don't really want to work with Black people. I'm not going to hire Black people or provide, um, and I'll discriminate against people in housing. That becomes whole scale oppression. So then we might think about something like redlining, where banks and the federal government are participating and highlighting areas that are largely African-American and Latino and then not giving loans to those places, so oppression. And then maybe it becomes internalized oppression. I am so oppressed by government or spaces of faith or my society and culture that you begin to believe the stereotypes about oneself, right? So thinking about a cycle of oppression. You can do this with gender. So go back for a moment and think about the social identifiers I asked you to think about. Can you select a social identifier and take a moment to move through the cycle of oppression with that identifier? It could be race. You could want to work with gender or sexual orientation or ability. How would you work through? the cycle of oppression with that identity. And take a moment to write down the stereotypes, the prejudice, the discrimination, the oppression, and then if it's applicable, what that internalized oppression looks like. 
Take about 45 more seconds. Now here's the thing about stereotypes. Um, sometimes they're individual to people. Sometimes they are based on groups, particularly in the United States, there's a particular form of what we'll call anti-blackness. And that is this idea that, um, uh, ideas that are embedded and that we have heard Ibram Kendi talk about, for instance, when he came and gave the Kirk lecture of this deeply embedded idea that people of African descent are inherently um, inferior. And that gets played out in ideas about family, uh, ideas about values, ideas about who was worthy, um, and that there are different kinds of stereotypes for different people, right? And sometimes we're really hesitant to admit stereotypes. So stereotypes are not necessarily what you believe, right? They're in the either. They're ideas that we have heard, and they often can inform ideas and prejudices that people have, right? And they're not accurate, right? They're not accurate stereotypes. Stereotypes are not accurate. They're part of ideas that people often have. Does anyone want to share um, what social identifier they put through the cycle? Would anyone like to share? You can put it in the chat or you can say it out loud. I can, can say something. One is, Black people are not as smart as white people and don't speak well. And this has happened to me. In, in school, the Black people are placed in a speech class because they don't speak well. Then they are discriminated because they cannot participate in debates because they do not speak well. Therefore, they are not a part of debate teams. The internalized oppression is, I remember all the speech class words I could not pronounce more than 50 years later. It still stays with you. It still, still stays, stays with, with you. Me. Right. And you can and you can tell, Catherine, that I too have had that experience, right? Because I started off the talk oh. with Yes, I am articulate um, because I so frequently have heard as a woman of color this surprise that I can string a sentence together. Um, and that is in part because it's a stereotype that people of color, particularly people of African descent, um, can somehow not speak where that is not a my experience. Also, to be completely, you know, forthright about my own social identifiers and privilege, I have an incredible amount of educational privilege an incredible amount of educational privilege. Only two to 3% of the US population has a doctorate degree, right? Um, I grew up in a household with more than 50 books available to read, right? There's some privilege, but there's this assumption right there. And so a microaggression for me and for many other people is this idea, oh yes, you are articulate. And it's like, but what was the expectation otherwise? And why was there an expectation otherwise? But also, what is standard speech? Who gets to decide what standard speech is and what articulate means, right? Who gets to decide that? And so often we're um, encouraged as a society that white cultural ways of being and speaking and articulating are the appropriate things and ways to be. Um, and that leaves out so many different forms of expression. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing. But we've talked about the cycle of oppression. I wanna talk about the cycle of liberation as developed by Bobby Harrow. As I mentioned in the chat, you will get a link to a reading about the cycle of liberation. Um, it comes in a, a Google file where you, a folder where you will get a link to a playlist that I created for thinking about lamentation and race. You'll get also a reading list and the cycle of liberation and some additional readings as well. And a, in addition to this PowerPoint, you'll get a version of it so that you can go back and revisit it and spend time with it. But if we think about the cycle of liberation as waking up, so first acknowledging 
wait a minute, preparing oneself, getting ready, reading, research, learning, reaching out. So creating a group of other people who can learn with you. Building a community. So building a community around thinking about liberation. Coalescing. What are our goals? What is our vision for change? And then creating change and then maintaining our constant education, right? So thinking about a cycle of liberation and thinking about this is a place that once we come out of our limit, right? Thinking about that place of hope and restorative action, that we come to a place of a cycle of liberation and that we might model liberation. So I, I want to end, of course, with James Cone, who is a preeminent a theologian and African-American, um, and this idea that it seems that one weakness of most theological works is their coolness in the investigation of an idea. Is it not time for theologians to get upset, right? Is it not time for us to lament? Is it not time for us to lament racism and white supremacy? Is it not time for us to demand something different, and Cone notes that even the prophets spoke in anger. Even Jesus got angry, right? That part of lament is to become angry, right? And to get upset. But there's a process by which you can find restorative hope and justice. And then I wanted to think, discern and celebrate the presence of Jesus in the lives of the abused and the oppressed that this is an idea that grounds a black womanist theology. What does it mean to celebrate the presence of Jesus in the lives of the abused and oppressed, right? Will it get us to a lament that pushes us into a space of a cycle of liberation rather than a cycle of oppression? And I wanted to end my formal remarks by asking, what is the liberatory lamenting song in your weary throat, to go back to Polly Murray. What is the liberatory lamenting song in your weary throat? And I'd like you to take a moment to think about your lamentations around race. What is your racial lament? And as you are comfortable, you are welcome to put your lamentation in the chat. Um, and I want to say thank you. Um, these are the ways that you can reach me either on Twitter or via email. And then I'm going to pause here and open for questions. How's everyone doing? Let's first take a, deep, <laughs> take a deep breath in. For three and release for three. Take a deep breath in, hold it for three and release it for three. And one more time, take a deep breath in and release it for three. Take a moment to be in your body. Roll your shoulders for me, please. And then if both of your feet are on the ground, I'd like you to imagine that roots are growing out of your feet and down toward the center of the earth. Down, 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 down to the center of the earth. You are grounded. And then take a deep breath in for three. And then release for three. Take a deep breath in for three. And release for three. And then you can open your eyes and we can be present with one another. So I know this was a lot of information. Um, I definitely had my scholar hat on and in this, this, this go round. Um, 
But I think that part of the key part for me in thinking with Polly Murray, this is really a thought practice in thinking with Polly Murray, was thinking about what's the song in our weary throat, but also the amount of education and learning that we're going to have to do to break down white supremacy and really look at racial lament. That it's not simply the lament that we start off with, but that it really encourages us to think about investigation and that we must think about a Black woman as theological perspective on lamenting, which doesn't stop at appeal, that moves into hope and restorative action. And that that restorative action for some of us can be really healing, as in we need to do healing work. And for some of us, it's deep education, particularly around a history of racism in this country. So I hope that gave us a little buffer space that we're feeling okay, but that we might open up with our two more minutes remaining. Um, if there are any questions. I'll ask the question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go on. Oh, go on. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You go ahead. No, no, no. Well, I just want to thank you, Isaiah. You've given us some wonderful models. Uh, what really came up for me is when I worked in the corporate world, that um, fortunately I was in places where I was able to ch challenge the status quo. And one of the things I challenged all the time was the use of qualified in front of, of, of people of color. We have to find a qualified black male. We have to find a qualified white female. And I always challenge that because that, that adjective was never placed in the front of white people. Um, so I don't find myself having to do that as much now as I did at one time, but thank you for the models of how to move through that and get out of that. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Right, some of the healing that we have to do from microaggressions, right? And the transgression of microaggressions, that that is a trauma that people experience over and over. And that trauma becomes a lament of when, how long, oh Lord, yes. how long, oh Lord, yes, I yes, continue yes. to deal with this trauma over and over again, yes. right? Yes, thank you. Ma Go ahead, Jill. Oh. And then we'll go to you, Catherine. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, it's just it's mind blowing as always. Your 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 wonderful wealth and the way you you wealth of information and the way you share it so cogently. I was particularly struck by the cycle of liberation, and was hoping that the notes have um, a more detailed expository because I really want to focus on that in my life. So I would say that um, you'll notice that I just put in the Google chat a link to the folder that um, will have a uh, reading about the cycle of liberation. And I would encourage people to look at the cycle of oppression and liberation in conversation with each other. So often um, just looking at the cycle of liberation, we skip over lament. So we wanna pair them both together um, and think about, and also that the cycle of liberation includes lament in it, right? That we have to be accountable to our own lamentations, right? We have to be present to them. Good. Good. Um, Pastor Will, I believe that we are at time, but I, I know that this was a heavy topic, so I'm happy to hang about for a little bit as people need to sort of reflect or if there are additional comments um, or questions that people have. I understand we had one more question that I know from Catherine. So Catherine, if you'd like to, mm -hmm. to pitch your question, uh, out to the group. So it's a comment more, my lament and perhaps anger is that as we become more knowledgeable and people have personal reflections and there's new books and new language, that that becomes translated into some systemic changes. Mm -hmm. That's my lament and perhaps my anger. Yeah, I go back to that baby Suggs moment of really encouraging people, love your hearts and that particularly for people of color, to take care of yourselves in this moment of lamentation and trauma, um, to care for your hearts. Yesterday marked a year since Breonna Taylor 
was killed in Louisville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. that we are about to approach trials for Kyle Rittenhouse um, and for the killer of George Floyd. This is a time when people of color in particular, your first obligation is to yourself and to the care of yourself and the lamentations of your soul. Mm -hmm. So friends, we want to thank you again for being with us today uh, for this uh, part of the lecture series that we're in. Uh, Isetta, thank you so much uh, for the gift of your presence and your insight and your wisdom and your groundedness. You are such a blessing uh, to me uh, and all of us at Foundry. Uh, so I'm grateful for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to do this. Thank you for everyone for coming today. Lament, as we've learned today, is not an expression of faithlessness in God but an act of profound faith toward God. As we've concluded each of these lectures, we've offered this blessing written by John O'Donohue and called For Suffering, which we now offer to you. May you be blessed in the holy names of those who, without knowing it, help to carry and lighten your pain. May you know serenity when you are called to enter the house of suffering. May a window of light always surprise you. May you be granted the wisdom to avoid false resistance. When suffering knocks on the door of your life, may you glimpse its eventual gifts, and may you be able to receive the fruits of suffering. May memory bless and protect you with the hard-earned life past travail to remind you that you have survived before, and though the darkness is now deep, you will soon see approaching light. May the grace of time heal your wounds. May you know that though the storm may rage, not a hair of your head will be harmed. Until next time, friends, be gentle with yourselves, and blessings on the journey. <laughs>